are. Hi. Hello, Robert in place. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today? Fine. I see, right. I see you have a collection of my decks and books there. Yes. Well, you know, I tried to set the stage for the conversation today. So um, these are actually the only decks that I have in my collection. Unfortunately, uh, one of my most coveted decks, is, of course, is the Tower of the Saints, which is missing, but uh, I will hunt it down one of these days. Yeah, so. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to uh, reprint that myself. That was published by Llewellyn. Right. And, um, you know, um, the, it, was, it was translated to Spanish also in Portuguese. Really? Oh, that, yeah. well, that's, that's a helpful. I'm just going to turn my, my volume up here so I can hear you a little better. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll keep an eye out on eBay. I'm sure I'll find it one of these days, maybe at a, at a uh, garage sale. You never know. It might pop up. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. But uh, there are plenty of images on the internet, too, so I can sort of use, uh, you know, uh, look at the pictures and read about the deck. Do, so. you have the, do you have the Buddha Tarot? I do not, no. Because that's being republished. Oh, that, well, that's good to know. That's, that's yeah. going to be published by Schiffer, and that should be out in the spring. Okay. Oh, so you're you're doing some work with with Schiffer. That's interesting to know. I decided I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to hassle um, reformatting the book. <laughs> I hear I you. Enough on my place. So I said, well, I'll let them do it, and then you know, and besides, then it's just another person uh, promoting me, you know, because the publisher then is promoting me. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I know that you do. I I know when I was interviewing Rachel, she had mentioned she was talking about the Raziel Tarot. Uh, and she mentioned that you do all of your publishing independently, which I, I didn't know at the time. I mean, it made sense after she said it, but, uh, well, Hermes, Hermes publications is me. Right. I get that now. And, uh, that's very interesting. I, of course, I wore my Hermes shirt in honor of you. Oh, good. So, you know, uh, did, hopefully did you have one of my uh, Hermes tack pins. I bought it. Yes, I did. I got one. But, yeah. Okay. I got to say the little bag that came with it was, uh, like pleasant like it was a surprise i had no idea of, you know you know i've been to china quite a bit you know okay so, and they, they're real cheap you know so it's like these beautiful little embroidered brush brocade bags and it's like wow it's so cheap you know so i just got them for jewelry and stuff yeah i love it i actually put all of my tack pins in there i have like one from the brady tarot i have like a whole bunch of older pins that i have so i was like i'm gonna keep all my pins in this uh little bag but i did appreciate that well, I, I hope you're well today, and I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, it's really an honor for me uh, to, you know, to be able to have a conversation with you. Uh, I was sort of a latecomer to your to your work. You know, um, I've I've only started recently uh, in this last year uh, getting your decks and reading your book. Uh, the book behind me. This is one of you know probably the best books and most comprehensive books that I've ever read. Uh, on tarot it's really i mean it's it's like an encyclopedia um and i i wonder about that um you know did you write this book like thinking about the old occult sort of style encyclopedias like is this your le Mans primitif sort of uh that's what work? i grew up, you know i grew up on stuff like that right you know like uh the the, the uh, museum of uh you know magic and alchemy and I mean, I, and I, I don't even remember the title, but but that was an important book to me that I had when I was in college back in the '60s. Okay. And 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 that's a real old, you know, it's a book from like the beginning of the 20th century. Nice. And when I look in, li you know, I go to libraries, and you know, if you, I grew up in New Jersey, where you're in Pennsylvania, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Just outside of Philly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, I, I've been to Philly quite a few times, and. Uh, you know, I grew up in New Jersey and like, you know, we, in the college, we'd go and search uh, some of the old libraries and you'd find they'd have these occult books. And there was, a, there was an occult book publisher in Hackensack that used to do a lot of uh, uh, hoodoo books and things like that, you know, going all the way back to the 20s. Yeah. So, this is, so you know, I mean, I sort of grew up on, on um, you know, this early 20th century uh, occult uh you know phenomenon that was happening in the united states i mean a lot of, there was a lot of see there's a lot of things like there a lot of people don't realize this like uh, people talk about the tarot but um the the there there were before the tarot was popular or even known in the united states people were already using uh divination decks the like based on the lindermann deck yes yeah you're familiar with the lindermann right yes you'll yep. be with my book right okay so, <laughs> all right so the absolutely thing, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, what happened is a lot of there were a lot of German immigrants in the United States. Uh, you know, uh, going back to uh, the uh, you know uh, beginning of the 20th century and, and into the 1800s. And uh, so what? Ha so uh, in the in the, eight, the like right after you know the, the Lerner Mondex were first published in Germany uh, in um, what was it 1840s I believe right and. Uh, the, and right, you know, right soon after that, within the first ten years, they're already being published in the United States because there was such a German uh, immigrant community here, and and there were Ger there was a German publisher that published the Dex in New York City. Okay. And they would publish publish them with little books in English and German, and that led to like a lot of off like American offshoots of of the of the uh, uh, Oracle Dex, where we have the you know the Gypsy Witch Deck and yes. You know, you know all the all these strange uh, decks that you know. My my wife bought this one. Uh, it, it's called the uh, the old gypsy, uh, you know, fortune telling cards or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and you know, this was designed for children back in in nineteen forties. Yes. And then she had it since she was a little girl. You know, she bought it for like twenty cents, in like wow. in, in the corner shop. You know. <laughs> interesting. So the um. That's really interesting. So I, I also I think Atella too was involved with uh, playing cards initially, right? Because they were all sort of variations of playing cards. Atella um, was um, his initial books were on divination with just regular playing cards. Right. Okay. And 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 he he seems to have studied with uh, traditional readers in northern Italy, from what we can see, in in the the Piedmont area. Yes. Uh, which is like you know near France, of course. Sure. Yeah, and. Um, uh, he, and, he, and so his first book was on, uh, you know, it has, I forgot what the exact title is. It's really, you know, how to entertain yourself with a pack, you know, pack of, you know, it was like these ridiculously long titles that were yeah. popular back in the 1700s. And um, the, the uh, uh, he applied some of, like some of the uh, the techniques that he used on regular playing cards, he applied to the tarot also. But see, once Cord de Gibelon came out with uh, his, his book, Mon Primitive, and mentioned that the Torah was this ancient Egyptian text. Of course, the Taya had to, Taylor had to jump on the bandwagon and say, "Oh, I knew this all along." Yes. And and, and then he had to, you know, he, he actually when he, he tried to publish a, 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 his book on on the Torah, on how, you know how to entertain yourself with a, a deck of cards called the Torah, uh, something like that. And um, he, he ran into to some pro problems with. Uh, with the the censors because the, you know they were worried that he was plagiarizing uh, uh um but but somehow it got resolved and he got it published then then he and then you know he, he was actually see it's really interesting because a lot of the occultists put him down like they don't want to admit that they're based like all their ideas are based on a taylor yes but they are like weight's totally influenced by a taylor the, sure the, the golden dawn's all totally influenced by a taylor everybody is but they all put him down like they're not like right. and, they, and they call him oh oh yeah the hairdresser the wig maker and none of that <laughs> stuff was true he didn't he wasn't a hairdresser or a wig maker he just lived upstairs from one <laughs> right that's pretty interesting <laughs> and and well, he was actually an art dealer and he he dealt in engravings really so, so yeah so of course he knew all these people that made engravings so he hired one of them to make to redesign the deck and then he you know the grand detailer well yeah that's it's something that you know I I want to explore more the problem is finding uh, information in English on his deck. So, so that's the problem. It's like, I tried to, to track down books that oh. talk about his deck, you know, the Grand Atea or, uh, the, you know, I think Paul Houston's probably the closest I found to it. He created the Dame Fortune's Wheel Tarot. Uh, but you know, it's still a traditional tarot deck. It, it doesn't, it doesn't really cross-reference the, um, Egyptian style, uh, you know, the Book of Thoth type deck. Well, um, the book, you mean you mean like the Crowley Book of Thoth? No, his his so his so the the deck of Atea, the Grand Atea. Um, I'm trying to see if I have a copy handy. It's in a very different format. Like he uses the same type of majors for the most part, but he's changed and added a few. But it's just a totally different format. It's yeah. very very different. Um, it's it doesn't have. Um, I have one handy. Let me see where where it is here. Um. Oh, it's right here. Hold on just a moment here. I have actually one that was printed in Italy, which is older somewhere, but uh, this is just to, to give you an idea. So, well, see, so you have 
the wheel of fortune here. I don't know if you can see yeah. that really well. Oh yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, but uh, it's just in a different sort of format. Oh yeah, you know I mean, obviously, obviously that looks a lot like Leo Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's what this is based on. They, this yeah. is called the the Tower of the Egyptians, but it it is the Atella deck for for the most yeah. part. Yeah. But the problem is when I was trying to learn about this deck, I couldn't find much uh, information on it. You know what I mean? Uh, in English, like he has a book. And I think it's even on Google Books because it's so old and it's free, but it's all, I believe, in French. And there are some Italian decks or Italian books out there, but nothing's translating in English. Well, well, Ron Decker, you know Ron Decker? Uh, I've never heard of him, no. Okay, well, you, you, you know uh, Michael Dummett. Sounds very familiar. He's, but... he's, he's, been, he's one of the main historians. He, he was a prof professor of logic at, uh, I believe it was Oxford. Okay. And, uh, and 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 he did, but he got involved with tarot cards and he wrote uh, the the game of tarot, which was considered like a landmark history book on the tarot. But the thing is, it really poo pooed all the occultists. Yeah. And he and he and he researched the game of tarot and the whole history of the cards. And and so that was that was sort of a starting place for me back, you know, when I like back in the nineteen eighties when I started researching all this. Yes. Um, and then, and then he, and then what, there was so much interest in the occult tarot, so he decided to do a book on the occult tarot. So he teamed up with Ron Decker, who was uh, the, uh, he he was uh, the curator at the Playing Card Museum. Uh, I think I believe it's in Ohio. Just writing down his name so I can look into it. <laughs> anyway, I've met him many times, like at conferences and stuff, and we're like friends. I mean, I haven't seen him in years, but the thing is, like for a while there. He, re he did a lot of, re see, Ron Decker was more interested in the occult aspects, whereas even in their, uh, their book, uh, like it was, uh, the first book uh, was called A Wicked Pack of Cards, and it was Dummett, Decker, and, and DePaulis, who was a, a French scholar, and they teamed up to write this book on the history of the occult tarot. Yes. And the first part. Then, they, then they did a second book, it was Ron Decker and Dummett did the second uh, volume. Uh, and the thing is, uh, in the first volume, they, they, they discuss a Taylor, but the thing is, Ron Decker did most of the research and he really went beyond what was in that book and he wanted to do more with it. So he wrote, he wrote another book on the Torah where he goes much more into a Taylor. So I recommend getting his books. Yeah. In fact, what ha for a while there, we were gonna team up. He wanted me to redesign the Atela, you know, and he, like he would write a book with it and I would redesign it and work together on it. But, what, but it, didn't see, it seemed like there were so many other people already doing the a Taylor like Dex and it, and it wasn't as big enough market. We never, never, in other words, it never got off the ground. Yeah, we, we just talked about it, and, I, and he would send me, he'd send me his ideas and stuff. And so, so he, so a lot of my information about the a Taylor in my book that you have on the shelf there is based on Ron Decker. Okay. And if you look in the bibliography, I think you'll see all the books I'm mentioning. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good to know. I so, so uh, you don't have to memorize them. You just look. <laughs> that's true. Well, I, you know, because I I'll have to write it down because otherwise I'll forget in ten yeah, minutes. Just but... underline it in the back of the book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'll do. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, finding Itella's words himself though is, is is also a challenge. But that that I'd rather read a book written by someone else anyway because it's just you know a lot of that older stuff is just very dated and and very just tough to get through um, for me. Even if it, especially if it's translated. Uh, you know. Yeah. Well, like, well, the, th the thing is, I, you know, I went to the New York Library. When I was doing uh, research. I went to the main branch in Manhattan, and they have a Taylor's uh, book on the tarot there, and it's in yeah. several volumes. And, it's the, and each, and each volume starts with an engraving of one of the uh, cardinal virtues. Wow. Which is really interesting. Also, yes. uh, Taylor was an alchemist. In fact, he's considered the last alchemist from the classic age of alchemy. Wow. And he, and, he, and he taught courses like not only on divination with cards and stuff, but taught courses on alchemy and magic. You know, sure. I mean, basically what he basically invented all the things I do. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so very interesting. Away from me, I I would say a bit just about your book. You know, it's it's a very comprehensive book, and it's dealing with very complicated topics uh, that can be very confusing. But you do it both briefly thoroughly and also like in a way that you can understand it like it's like just your summary of alchemy or uh of um neoplatonism which which I'll, I'll get get to uh in a bit it's just it's very easy to digest for 
it was well done. The book was well done is, is basically what I'm saying. And, and, um, when I, when I did my first book, uh, you know, the Tarot, uh, history, symbolism, and divination was published by uh, penguin, the torture branch of penguin. And yeah. my, uh, my editor, Mitch, you know, really, you know, I, I, I really credit him for, he really helped, uh, tone up my writing like I always felt like you know people have always felt that I was you know could explain myself really well since I was in college you know and you know so it seemed like I always was a writer even if I didn't write anything yet but then when I started writing uh, I'm I, you know I got good reviews and stuff but the thing is when I worked with Mitch he really tried to tighten up my writing and he used to say to me he says look I want my mother to be able to understand this book and she doesn't know the subject yeah no I listen and, it, it was well you know, done yeah, it's like the thing is like picture your your reader is going to be somebody who's intelligent but doesn't know anything about the subject. Yeah. So I, that's that was like Mitch's mother. So I keep thinking, okay, I'm writing for Mitch's mother. You know? Yeah, you would like you would bring up a topic and then you would explain it and then you would set sort of segue. Okay, now we're ready. It was very conversational, almost like a lecture, like a like a, but it was very easy to read and you would segue into the to the topic. You'd be like, well, I, you, you would bring up the topic, you would explain it. And then you would segue into your next point, which I thought was really just so easy. I mean, for me, I just was like, wow, this is really, it looks intimidating because it's a huge volume. It's a huge book. It has all these complex topics, but I found it very uh, easy to understand. So yeah, well, that was my goal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, job well done. <laughs> um, so, you know, you say that the tarot found you, and I know this is a story that you um, have told oh, many times. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but well, actually, so I want to take it a step further because I, I wanted to actually have you start at the beginning. Like, what sort of spiritual background uh, did you have as, as a child? Like, what was your experience? Uh, where, did you grow up in a religious home? You said you're from Jersey, so just, well, just wondering. My, my family's Irish. Irish okay. American. So we were Catholics. So you know, the, I mean, I I was I was very enamored with the uh, the mystic mystical aspects of Catholicism and and the artwork, but I wasn't too enamored with uh, the way the way the church was uh, so heavily moralistic. Yeah, you know, and and I felt misguided many times. But the thing is, I love going to the church and looking at the stained glass windows and. Uh, you know all the all the all the magical trappings like you know you, you have the scapula that you'd wear and you know and they give you little missiles and yes all, all all these like icons and things you know yeah I grew up the same way actually and I had the same exact experience it's funny I um I was just actually talking to a Catholic priest yesterday his name is uh Sean Father Sean Olehe I, I believe um I think he's Irish yes he's very Irish he's <laughs> from Ireland but he's very into Celtic spirituality. Yeah. Uh, and he talks a lot about the, he's a, he's a, he's a Christian mystic for sure. He's very much a mystic. Uh, and he's a priest in California. So he's extremely liberal, you know? Um, but you know, we were talking about, um, a lot of different things, but he's very into the Elm. He's into, uh, it seems like the Irish are very much, even the Catholics are very much more mystical people. They're into, and I think that may be because they're linked to the Celts, uh, you know, cult culturally and spiritually in some way. Yeah. I, well, I, yeah, a lot of people have written whole books about that. I yes, mean, of course. Yeah. So, but I just wonder for, for you growing up as a Catholic, you know, well, I wonder no, that, if that my was, my family wasn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Still in you, you know what I mean? You, you inherit that, that Celtic kind of, uh, what I'm saying is that the thing is that what's about the thing about the church is that it, 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 what you know, even though it wasn't in, in Latin, you know, they started changing it to English and doing all these things. There's this, there's all this artwork in the building, you know, the stained glass windows, uh, the statues and, and, uh, and then there's all these little works, these little artistic things that give you like little mass cards and missiles and yeah crucifixes and you know like all these all these icons and magical uh, things you know and, and then and it's and it's just out i mean they never say it's magic they never say they're practicing magic but the whole thing they're just playing with words yes you know see that i explained that in my book because it's sort of like when you know what what it, when they changed basically uh you know when they changed the the bread and the wine into the body and blood of christ during the mass that's a magical transformation yes definitely I mean, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's basically what magicians do when, uh, when they talk about the planets being in metals or different materials or, and, and how the, there's, uh, this whole, uh, all these correspondences that people make use of in magic. So, yeah. 
So that's what they're doing. Or, the, or like uh, when they get, you know, when they gave me the scapula and they say, if you wear the scapula and it always protects you. And if you died wearing a scapula, you go right to heaven. And it's, obviously it's a magical uh, amulet. Yes. But yeah. We tend to, we tend to think of religions um, separately and as um, you know, sort of separate experiences. But in your book, you, you talk about a synthesis of different cultures and religions. You talked about Egypt and Greece you know, and then you, you, you go into the whole history of sort of what you're describing, which is the influence on the church, even like the Neoplatonism. So would you be able to um, maybe just explain a little bit about uh, Neoplatonism? And, uh, well, well, ne well, basically, Neoplatonism is really just Platonism that, see, the thing is, what, the German philosophers in the 1800s um, coined the word Neoplatonist. There were no Neoplatonists in history. No one called themselves that. They would just thought they were Platonists. But the thing is, what the German philosophers tried to do is they tried to sift what they, they felt was the real Platonic philosophy from all these hybrid philosophies that, you know, uh, like what you're talking about, where there was a synthesis of Platonic philosophy with all different things like Egyptian religion or other uh, or mystical ideas, and, you know, Gnosticism and all these things. So uh, they coined the word Neoplatonism to cover those mystical, uh, the, the mystical synthesis of Platonism. With these uh, with these other elements, and then they called and they called Platonism the original Platonism. But when you read Plato, the original, it's already mystical. So they, yeah, and and they and they're making him like the champion of logic when he which he is, but he's also a mystic. And and then you know like there's all these these ideas about Plato which are misnomers, like that that he was uh, he basically uh, was anti mythology. You hear, hear that a lot, like he was breaking with Greek mythology. But then when you read Plato, you see that he's using logic to explain his ideas but when it goes when it gets to a place where it can't logic can't do it he has to go beyond logic he, he starts talking he has has myths you know everybody knows the myth of the cave and yeah. and and you know there's many myths there's the myth of of, of Ur who, who dies and go, goes to the afterlife and comes back and uh there's the myth of the chariot and the infant uh, you know uh the, the uh, Phaedrus, where, where uh, Socrates is talking about the soul is like a chariot and, yes. and trying to get back up to the heavens. So, so and, and, and all these myths, I felt, were the mo some of the most important parts of, Pla of Plato's dialogues, because these are where he was getting to the mystical aspects that he couldn't put, that had to go beyond logic, that had to be told in a myth. Yes. And see what happens to the German philosophers who sort of ignored that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then they act like when when it was combined with with uh, see like if you take Platonism, which was like really Platonism was this immensely popular uh, school of philosophy all through the ancient world and inf you know influenced for hundreds of years. Like that's why we have all you know the only reason we have Plato's books is because people copied them. You see, like ancient books, right? They, they were originally written on papyrus. Eventually, they started making parchment and things like that, you know, because papyrus was coming out of Egypt, and Egypt was very, uh, they were sort of jealously guarding the papyrus because they only had so much. So people had to come up with other things to make books on. So they started, you know, skinning uh, uh, goats and, or sheep or calves and making parchment. Um, but the thing is, parchment books will fall apart and deteriorate. So we wouldn't have the books. But what happens is that scholars in libraries would copy them over again on new a new parchment, or or new uh, you know a papyrus. So, uh, so that's how the books come down to us from these compendiums of of, of uh, that scholars, uh, you know, co would copy what they thought was valuable. So like this whole lot of stuff that was lost because nobody thought it was valuable, so they just let it rot away. But see what happens is in Egypt. It, the climate is so dry that it actually preserved papyrus for a very long time, or like in Israel. Like, so that's why you can find the Dead Sea Scrolls, or we found the Gnostic Gospels, and these things that basically wouldn't be around, except the, the dry climate there preserved them. So we can see like an older version of some of these ideas, you know, we can see, we can see where, like, the, there were all these, I mean, you know, we have four Gospels in the Bible, but when you look at the Gnostic Gospels, you see there's all kinds of Gospels that were like the Orthodox Church just decided, oh, we don't want those. Let, let those deteriorate. We don't want those in the Bible anymore, because yes. you know, because see, orthodox means right thinking. So then, so those uh, those are not right thinking. Those those are heretical. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, that was all done at the Council of Nicaea, right? Uh, all that stuff was sorted out. Well, it, well, over it was that was one place. It, it happened over a long time. In, in, yeah. In, uh, in many stages, basically. But everybody knows the Council of Nicaea was sort of a turning point.
Um, I mean, you know, there's scholars that just focus on that. We'll go into it in great detail and pinpoint all these things. But I, I, I don't know. If, but it's, it's not necessary to know all those details, just to know the general uh, idea that basically, I mean, it's, if you keep in mind that text, the only reason we have text is because they were copies, so it means they were popular. So yeah. you know if we have it, it was popular. I mean, that's all you really, that's, that's all I'm trying to make. Uh, yeah, of course. You know, well, Plato is surely, you know, probably the most influential philosopher of all time. Okay. So now, so now all these other, like we come to Egypt, now we have the synthesis because, you know, Alexander the Great, uh, you know, made this empire that included Egypt and Persia and Greece all together, going all the way to India. Um, his generals split it up. So Ptolemy, one of his generals, he, he, he got Egypt. And then yes. and so now we have, so now the rulers of Egypt are basically Greek. Uh, and, and there's a synthesis of Greek culture with Egyptian culture. So now the, uh, the, the mystical ideas that have come down th through the centuries in, in, Greek, uh, in, in uh, Egyptian religion are now being synthesized with this Greek culture. And so they're starting to write them down in Greek. Also, the, we find that the, there's a large Jewish community, community in Alexandria. And they're the first ones, they, they translated the Bible to Greek because they actually spoke Greek. See, people assume that they have ancient Jews, they must be speaking Hebrew, but, they, but most of them spoke Greek right. or Aramaic. Well, if you look at like the Gospel of St. John, or they, they were all written in Greek, all of the early uh, Christian texts. Because Greek was the, was the language that unified the whole Middle East, you know, from Greece to Egypt to Persia, all around that. In fact, you, even find, you can even find columns in India that are written in Greek. Yes. They have proclamations written in Greek. Now, the Apocrypha, um, that is a, a Greek document as well, isn't it? Is it a, a collection of the a Greek documents? Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you know, as far as, I don't know, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if they, I assume they all are. But the thing is, uh, that's not, you know, um, the, the thing, because, you know, the question you asked me is, so, okay, what is Neoplatonism? So we're trying to get to that. Yeah. So the thing is, what happened is these, uh, these hermetic, scholars we call them hermetic because they signed their work hermes trismegistus and what what hermes trismegistus was really a greek version of thoth and thoth was the god who was the uh the scribe of the gods so the, the scribe of uh, osiris and uh he, he he supposedly invented the hieroglyphs so he invented writing so when they talk about the book of thoth like you know in like a cult circus always talking about the book of thoth well what the book of thoth is is the first book ever written and and thing is, Thoth not only invented writing, but he knew the power of words. He, he he had what they call words of power. In other words, what the things he said would manifest. So like when like in some versions of the myth of Osiris, when Osiris dies and and Isis finally finds the body and brings him back to Egypt, and and then you know set breaks him into fourteen pieces and she puts him back together, and then she has to bring him back to life, and she actually has Thoth comes with his words of power and he uses the words of power to bring him back to life. Yes. Okay. So, so the idea is that, so in Thoth's book, which would be the first book ever written, he wrote down all his ideas because he, because Thoth was, was the vizier of Osiris and he's the one who taught everybody not only how to write, but he taught them geometry and, uh, uh, you know, architecture and, uh, uh, like, like farming technique, like all, the, all the civil, civilizing, um, things you know the, the studies that you need to know to be a civilized uh country these are all were all ascribed to, to thoth and this was happened in this golden age when when osiris was the was the uh uh was the ruler you know he, he was the pharaoh his his sister isis was, was his wife and then thoth was their was their vizier and then that's it was this golden age when and that's when they really became civilized because of this influence so that so he is so so thoth is like this uh pivotal figure like 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 the like it's almost like that's the origin of everything we care we care about everything all the things we want to learn about so he knows not only does he know about mathematics and geometry and architecture and writing and and all these things but he knows magic and he knows the words of power so this is the most powerful book in the world and of course so so what so uh now thoth or i mean actually even thoth is a, a greek uh, version of his name because his name in, in in Egyptian is something like Jehudi or Tehudi, uh, and Thoth is is basically how they interpret it in Greek. But then they associated him with Hermes, who was the messenger 
of the gods. You know, so if, so if, if Osiris is like Zeus and, and then uh, Hermes is, is his messenger, then Thoth would be uh, the same role uh, as Hermes. So they associated with Hermes, but that, so they would, so very often in the Greek text, they would start writing Hermes instead. But now when they, when you use the name Thoth, there was an epitaph after it, like it would be like, Thoth, the one, the only, the greatest, you know, <laughs> like you couldn't just say Thoth. You had to have this thing. Yes. Okay. So he was thrice great, you see. So, uh, so basically for the, for the, um, just for the sake of expediency, they would write Hermes Tris Megasus, which just means Hermes Thrice Great, instead of having to go the one, the only, the greatest. Yes. Every time he wrote his name. So, uh, so Hermes Tris Megasus is this mythical figure. Now, the, these, these uh, mystics in, uh, in Alexandria and in Egypt started writing all these books making, you know, that were basically a synth synthesis of Greek Platonic philosophy and these ancient Egyptian mysteries. And, and they would sign the works Hermes Trismegistus instead of their own name, which is a common idea in the ancient world that because they, it's like, we sort of think of like, okay, they're, basically they're lying, right? You know, <laughs> because they didn't, Hermes didn't write it. They, they you know, Hermes is a, is a, is a myth, mythical character. So how could he write the book? So uh, it's sort of like if I wrote a book now and said, Jesus wrote it, you know? Yeah. But, you know, but then some people do that because they say, oh, I'm channeling Jesus. Right. Uh, okay. So in a way it's not clear, but there's just a common idea that if this, if these, these ideas they were putting down weren't theirs, but they were trying to uh, pass them on or transmit them. So they were assigning them to Hermes. So they would sign his name to it, almost like they were channeling him. But it's not clear that they're actually channeling him so much as that the ideas were, uh, they originated with him. Yes. So, in, so in the Hermetic text, there's like uh, 20 of them originally. We don't have all of them. I think we have most of them. Uh, the, the, uh, the Hermetic texts present Hermes as just actually a man who lived long ago in the Golden Age. But that because he studied uh, mysticism, he purified himself and gained gnosis, which is this knowledge that, that it's not knowledge like book learning knowledge, but knowledge that transforms you. And so by gaining gnosis, he became, he, gaining gnosis, he became like a god. And, and so, uh, so the book is explaining how he did that. And then so it becomes like a textbook. These different texts in there are like a textbook for how to become like a god or how to gain gnosis or what you might say a textbook on enlightenment. That's a very Jewish concept, too. I think you explained it in the book, too, about Ezekiel uh, sort of attaining. Um... Well, he, he see the thing, the difference, the main difference between Judaism and the Egyptian religion and the Egyptian religion and the Greek religion, there's many gods. So if you said somebody became like a god, that's not a big deal because all the hero, like, you know, Hercules was a man and became a god. You know, yeah. and the heroes became gods. So it's just a, it just means you're a hero or you did something heroic that made you above, you know, like more enlightened or more. Uh, exalted to other people. Whereas like when you see, when you come to Judaism, now there's only one God. See, they start playing, basically they're playing with the words. So, sure. but, the, but even though they have one God, there's still all these other archetypes. So now how do we cover those other archetypes if they're not gods? So then it's, oh, well, we have angels. Sure. <laughs> okay. Who, who are the messengers are, 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 you know, they work for God and then, and see, and then we come into Christianity, then we have like saints. You know, and then you can see that a lot of this, like, for instance, another form of, of Hermes in, in ancient Greece was uh, Anubis, who was the god of the dead. Now, Anubis looked like a jackal or a man with a jackal's head, right? Like a dog's head. Okay, now, if you look at, you know, and, and Anubis was basically, he, he was the guy who took you to the afterlife, who, who took you to the weighing of the souls, you know, in, the, in, the, in the, this final judgment. So, uh, if we look in Christianity, you'll see this image of St. Christopher which means the Christ bearer, right? And, and, that, and he's the, the patron of travelers, and so it was Anubis. And, and so there was this figures, like by the time we get to the classical world, there's this, these figures, Herman Anubis, where it's basically Anubis holding a caduceus. Like you see a man with a jackal, everybody's holding caduceus because he's really Hermes and Anubis together. So it's another form of where they associate with Hermes, because Hermes was also what we call a psychopomp, a, a guide for the dead. Okay, so now if you look at the earliest Orthodox icons of, um, St. Christopher, he has a dog's head. See, you know, and St. Christopher, was, when I was young, you know, growing up Catholic like that, you know, my father had a St. Christopher's medal on the car and he's really popular saying, then the Pope took him off the calendar. Cause basically, so well, why'd they do that? Cause if you look way back, he had a dog's head. Yeah. And so obviously he wasn't a real person. 
Well, I didn't know about the dog's head, but I do know about St. Christopher, obviously. Um, that's well, look, really... at the, look at the old Orthodox icons. Like, do a search on, uh, on the internet. You'll see. Yeah, definitely will. So do you think that this was all – so, like, this um, – for instance, these parallels uh, that exist in the Greek deities, the Catholic deities, do you think it's because it's just archetypal? Or do you think, uh, for instance, because, like, Pythagoras studied in, in Egypt, do you think th that they – got the stories directly from the Egypts and then made it their own? Or do you just think they're just archetypes that just manifested? Yes, just, all, all the above. Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, I mean, how could, yeah, the, the, the Young's theory of the archetypes is that these, these characters, the angels, the gods, you know, uh, the saints, they're all archetypes in our unconscious. Yeah. They're all parts of our psyche, of the total psyche. So, and they man, and that's why the same figures will manifest in all different, uh, uh, you know, cultures. And we can see that, and, and, the, and the ancient Romans knew, and the Greeks and Romans knew it. That. That's the whole reason, like when they came to Egypt, they didn't look at the Egyptian gods like they were some alien gods. They said, oh, look, they're worshiping Hermes and they call them Thoth. Yeah. See, and they thought it was the same god because, it, because they, they rose the god. And so in their own way, they rose the gods were archetypes. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what they are anyway. Um, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so, uh, how did you, you know, see this in the tarot? Um, I guess if that's not too complicated of, of a topic to, well, well, to briefly still, describe. I didn't completely answer your first question. Right, 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 right. Okay. So the thing is, okay. So the hermetic material gave birth to a group of philosophers that were much more like, they're much more, uh, connected to Greek philosophy, but they came out of the hermetic philosophy. Like, uh, you know, uh, Plotinus, who was considered the first Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, Ammonius Saccus was his teacher, and we don't have anything, any writings of Ammonius Saccus, but it's thought that is because Ammonius Saccus probably would have written, if he wrote a, a, a text, he probably would have signed to Hermes Trismegistus. You see, so, so out of this Hermetic school came the first uh, Neoplatonists, who were basically breaking more uh, from the, the from that mold of oh this is the, the teachings of hermes and going into like okay we're going to be more philosophical about it more in the like a little more platonic okay and 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 also there like you mentioned pythagoras now pythagoras lived uh he he, he lived several hundred years before uh uh you know like i think it was like two or three hundred years before plato and um he he's he you know in his biographies like it says you know that he he uh he would he would grow up on the island, island of samos in greece and that but he went to the middle east he went to egypt and he studied all the mysteries and then he settled in croton which is the south of italy and started his school and 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 basically uh, the mystical ideas that are in pythagoras are very similar to what you, you find in hermetic ideas right uh and also, he, it seems that there was a direct influence from Pythagoras on Plato. So a lot of the mystical ideas in Plato come from Pythagoras. So the Neoplatonists also are connected to the Pythagorean philosophy. And sometimes you can even call them Neo-Pythagoreans. It's the same. They're, they're, basically, they're basically synthesizing in a very strong way. They're, they're creating more of a, a philosophical framework for these mystical ideas that are in Plato and Pythagoras from the beginning. And see, that's why, you know, what I find fault with the German philosophers, because like, they're not even, they're not paying much attention to Pythagoras then. Yeah. You know, but, they, but they, see, the thing is like in the 17, 1800s, this is, there was sort of this whole cleansing of magic from our culture. You know, that's why we have, that's why we have all these, these uh, mystical brotherhoods and schools uh, emerging and trying to preserve these things. Because it's the age of so-called age of enlightenment, when basically uh, sci you know science is becoming more materialistic, and, yep. and they break from and then alchemy now becomes uh, chemistry and and physics and things like that. Yeah, I liked uh, I liked the one thing that you mentioned about uh, I, Von Franz, I believe her name was, is Jung's. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, she, uh, she she was one of she was the head of the Jungian like she was one of the, his main disciples and became the head of the Jungian school in, in Switzerland. Yeah, her, she's been on my reading list for a while. I, I've been meaning to read uh, some of her material, but uh, I felt I needed a better understanding of alchemy first uh, because I have read Jung. Um, I read a few of his books. I haven't really tackled the red book, but I, I read, uh, man and his symbols and I I've been into young for sort of a while. Um, but I like the line that you said about, uh, alchemists, uh, sort of 
you know, um, almost like Pythagoras did with numbers, like where he found, he studied not only how numbers, the practicality of the numbers, but he studied the metaphysical sort of meanings. Well, like sort of the alchemist did the same thing with, uh, you know, uh, trying to find meaning in science, you know, like, like mystical, in a mystical way, you know, spiritual way. Uh, and she said that's very misunderstood. You know, that, I think that was, I think that was the gist of what you were saying about that. Um, that, you know, in other words, like we, we sort of misjudge the alchemists as like kooks or quacks because, you know, we don't understand them in a, in a context of what they were trying to do, but they were just trying to put meaning into it. You know, it's yeah. like science meets meaning. Well, well the thing is, um, the, what ha see what happened in the 1600s, um, you know, you know, a a after, uh, um, Uh, Paracel Paracelsus was a pivotal figure. He basically, like, the thing is, alchemists, no matter what they were doing, like, well, they, you know, they were discovering medicines, they were discovering perfumes, they were, but they also also had this idea of working on the great work, the magnum opus, which was to find the philosopher's stone. Okay, so Paracelsus said, instead of trying to find this universal cure, because the philosopher's stone could suppose to heal any illness and prolong life. Okay, and he said, instead of finding this universal, this panacea, one, we sh what alchemy should be doing is start making medicines to treat specific illnesses. And that's why he's considered the father of modern medicine. So he said, so he said, instead of having one great work, we have lots of, we're, you know, we're just always doing alchemical trans transmutations. We're, tra we're, tr we're taking chemicals and we're transforming it into, into healing medicines. Okay, so uh, after that, there was a split in alchemy where, uh, People got, you know, the, the field of medicine developed and, and out of medicine came chemistry, you know, because people assume that chemistry came first, but chemistry actually came out of medicine. Uh, and, uh, and, but then this other philosophical school where they, where they said, well, yeah, but this whole philosophical aspect sort of split off more. And then we have these alchemists like, uh, you, you know, like uh, Jacob Bohm and, 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 and these people in Germany who, uh, uh, you know, were, um, writing these beautiful texts like like you know the uh, atalanta fugians you know that book sounds very familiar but no it means atalanta fleeing okay okay and, and it's and it, by michael Mayer, and uh it was produced in the 1600s in germany and it's like it's got these beautiful engravings that are with these you know surreal things happening in all of them and but each page not only has this engraving but it has this whole text that's sort of po poetry like and then it has a musical score so it's this whole uh, combine it's this total art form you know you have vi visual and verbal and music and like all coming together you know if he could he, if he was modern modern one he would have made it into a movie you know so uh and and it's and, and it's and it's one of the most famous alchemical texts there is but it's philosophical alchemy and then and so the, so out of this philosophical alchemy uh we we got uh, you know these offshoots like these mystical brothers like the rosicrucians and of course, they they also uh, influence uh, the Freemasons, and and they start having these groups. Like, and that's when you get, and that's how the Golden Dawn comes about, and uh, yes. Otico and all these other groups comes out of that. And also, but not only that, but but Bohm and, and Michael Mayer had a strong influence on the German Romantics. So right when the whole culture is turning logical and scientific and materialistic, the arts become more and more magical to balance out the culture and see and that's what the romantics are so there's like the, there's this delving and romantic artists are delving into the spirit into the unconscious and the dreams and the symbolism and so out of the romantic movement we get pre-raphaelites we get uh, uh the romantic poetry the whole the whole myth of the vampire and and the, the demon lover and you know that whole thing happens and uh, so much of our culture now like what we see in movies and and see in books comes out of german romanticism and and uh, and I mean, I, my I actually as an artist, I've always been an artist since you know since I was born and, and knew what the term meant. I yeah. I would tell people I'm an artist. I mean, I could draw pretty realistically at a, a young age. But yeah. the thing I've always been influenced by that I did you know like I'm actually a romantic. I'm a product of that thing. And then I look to say, well, as a romantic, this whole thing came out of alchemy in the first place. It's it's yeah. it comes out of philosophical alchemy. That's so interesting. It's just interesting how it all evolves, you know, how, how it all evolved um, and synthesized. I think, I think I see behind you, you have like a print of a Van Gogh. 
Yeah, actually, my partner's a big Van Gogh fan, but this is a Van Gogh painting here, and then I do have a, a print of uh, Van Gogh. Yeah, self-portrait, yeah. Yes. The, yeah, yeah, we, well, the one with the, the cherry blossoms, I guess they were, you know. Yes. That's, that's, he was strongly influenced by Japanese prints. Yeah, and we that, actually, yeah, that, that's interesting because it, we have actually the, um, I forget the name of the artist, but the Japanese art in the kitchen, so. Oh, oh this, that's related to it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, well, the, the, um, and then the wave, you know, the tidal wave, uh, oh, I forget yeah. his, I forget oh, the name. Hokusai. Yes. Hokusai. Oh, you got to say Hokusai. Yeah. <laughs> you don't put a, an accent on any solo. <laughs> Very good. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. What's that oh. other, what's that other picture? It looks like there's a, a girl kissing or something. Over, Which one? Over, uh, above my books. Oh, this, oh, this is my, uh, this is, <laughs> This is the weirdest picture in the world. Well, this is actually a photograph, but it's me and my partner and our niece. And I'm dressed as Santa Claus in the back. Oh, I see. Yeah. And then because I, I always did Santa at, you know, at Christmas for the kids. Yeah. And you that's our, to, that's our little spray, niece. You're going to have to spray paint your beard, though. Yeah. yeah. Now I actually have a real beard so I can, you know, I, I don't have to wear the fake one. I can just spray paint it. One up on the wall. Oh, the, oh, this one. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, that's so Stephen, my partner, Stephen's mother had that. Uh, and we, when he was a kid and we saw it out at a flea market um, somewhere and he like loved it. So he, he wanted to put it up. I, I don't know the history of it. I just know his mother really liked it a lot. So we had that. I do have a lot of art in here. Uh, so is that a, it's like a lithograph or something? Or? Yeah, it's a print. It definitely is a print. It's not a painting. Um, but not sure exactly. Um, let me see what the name says here. Uh, Margaret Keane. Oh. Or Margine Kane. Margaret Kane. Um, it looks like Margaret Kane or Keane. K A I N E. Well, you know the Keane, the Keane, famous Keane paintings. I what guess I, I don't know that anything was, about that was her it. Husband, she her, her like Keane had this reputation for making the kids with the big eyes, but actually his wife did them. Oh well, and then there was this big scandal where she she uncovered that he was a fraud, and and then <laughs> and then she started selling her own work more like a, and and she and she and instead of making it so sen overly sentimental, like she just drew kids and stuff. Yeah. So that's one of those. I have a um I do have a a painting over here. I don't know if you could see. It. I have I have a painting over here which is Lisa Hunt from the um from the Ghosts and Spirits Tarot. Uh-huh. That's actually the original uh fool. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, so that that's one of the originals I have. I have a painting of Elton John that my step I was raised by an artist. Really? Uh I, I'm not an artist, but my stepfather as a kid was a cartoonist. He's a characterist. He does oh, like cool. par parties and events, you know, he's he's like he he's got a whole slew of like balloon clowns working for him now. He but when I was a kid, you know, he was he was a, a street vendor. So I would go out and he would set up his easel on the sidewalk and he would draw, but uh, and I would just kind of go there. And that's actually how I found my first tarot deck because uh, he would set up his easel on South Street um, and on 5th and South in front of Green Drugs. I don't know if you're familiar with South Street. But there's this uh, little store. It's called um, um, Garland of Letters. Uh -huh. And they have a big line in the front. And it reminds me of the strength card because when you go in, I just always pet the lion. Yeah, right, right. But when I went in as a kid, I, that's why I saw my first tarot deck. I had no idea what it was. I was 12. Uh, and I just was like, I want this deck. So, you know, that's, that's how I, I found my first deck and, and him, him being an artist, you know, I guess he under, he like appreciated that I, I wanted it, I guess. And he brought it like as a yeah, present that's for me. It. That's, that's my, essentially my whole point about the Torah, but it's a work of art. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, some, the, people, some people act like it's not like, it's just, a, it's just a, a secret code of symbols or something, you know, and they're not looking at the artwork. That always bothers me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, no, I, I agree. And especially today, I mean, you look at all the decks that are being created today. I was going to ask you, you know, how do you, what do you think about this whole Kickstarter and this, uh, this new sort of renaissance of, of, uh, of tarot decks? How do you, how do you. Well, I, I it's, it's fine. You know, it, the thing is the, the reason, you know, the reason that uh, um, baseball became the national pastime wasn't because we just had the big leagues. It was because every kid in the dirt lot was playing baseball. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yes. same thing. so if other people's involved in the Tarot, great. You know, I don't care. You know, they're not all going to be great decks, but it doesn't matter. It's just true. Do it at whatever level you can. 
True. And then, you know, then more appreciation for like really good decks. That was my fan that just fell <laughs> in the <laughs> back. I heard a bang. It's all right. It'll be fine. Um, it just fan fell over. Oh, Steven got it. Yeah, just, <laughs> of course. It's all right. He got it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So I had, um, I think you answered that Neoplatonism question um, pretty yeah, good. Well, I had another question. I don't know if it got to Well, it. I think it's just kind of heavy. I think I would just recommend people read the book because I don't, you know, it's really uh, a complex topic. But uh, I was just, I was going to ask how you could, uh, how you saw the tarot, the Neoplatonism sort of in the tarot. But it's explained very well in the book. So I would just recommend people get the book, I think, for that. Uh, so, you, you know, I think you answered the uh, first question uh, brilliantly. So, um, you can maybe just speak on that a little bit, but you don't have to get into the whole thing if you, if you like to. I mean, um, how, how, it, how, it's, how it's in the tarot. Yes, yeah. Okay, well, what is, well here's the thing. The tarot was, uh, in spite of all the occult, <laughs> occult misinformation, the tarot was really created in Renaissance Italy in the 1400s. Okay, now in Renaissance Italy, the reason it's called the Renaissance, you know, it was like in the late, uh, Renaissance, but they actually coined the name for it because they felt it was a rebirth of classical culture. But the the classical culture that was being reborn wasn't, you know, we have this image of the Renaissance as being like a, a time when sci you know people return to science and 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 classical ideas and philosophy and stuff. Um, but when we look at the, you know, when it started, when the first, when the Renaissance starts in in the thirteen uh, hundreds with Giotto, who's the Giotto is the first the Renaissance artist. And what, and then you see like Donatello, the sculptor. And what they're doing is they were uncovering ancient artwork, and they were breaking with the Byzantine tradition that which had overtaken Italy because of Christianity, where where the art was purposely flat because they were afraid of idolatry. And now people were uncovering statues of Venus, and they go, "Look, this is really beautiful. They got to do something like this, you know." So then people started, like, you know, like they're, at first they're sort of scared of this, you know, uh, and. Uh, like, like there's this story where I think it was one in, uh, what, what was it? Uh, I think it was in, uh, it might've been in Pisa where they uncovered a statue of Venus and, and the people were, you know, it was incredible, like incredible. It was probably one of these, uh, 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 you know, like the, the Venus where she's, you know, she's has her, like, she's look, sort of looks like she's, uh, you know, covering, trying to cover her groin and breast with her hands, you know, that, that mo modest, yeah. Post. yeah. Okay, so uh, they set it up in the square and everybody you know, loved it, but then there was this famine and then they got really guilty. So they said, oh my God, we, we're worshiping the idols and like, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, God's punishing us. So they said, well, okay, but I don't want to destroy the statue. So let's take it, we'll bury it in the, in the, in the neighboring, uh, uh, like this, this, the next city state, which is our rival and we'll give them the bad luck. <laughs> Yeah. So, buried, so being good Christians, they and they were worried about the statue being so they bury it on their neighbors to try and give them bad luck, you know. So, but that was it. Did, I, I, you know, that's the kind of stories you hear, like in the, in the early, like the 1300s, where there's this love hate going on. So, but then by the time we get to the 1400s, um, we see that there's this whole, like, like there's, there's, uh, you know, these scholars like Facino, uh, who are enamored with, uh, with with platonic philosophy like they didn't really know much about plato because they were, i think i think most of the most of plato, plato's books weren't really available in latin and they didn't read greek but what happened is because of the uh, the turks were taking over uh byzantium and and the byzantine empire was getting worried so constantinople sent uh, an envoy to to Rome, you know to, to italy to try and uh get support in italy to help back them militarily but they sent all this whole group of people like scholars and 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 see uh, neoplatonism was really popular in greece so these neoplatonic like one of the chief neoplatonic scholars in greece came to italy and and uh uh, the you know um, the Medici the, you know in, in Florence the, the uh, Cosimo the Medici uh, was so enamored with him that he told him he's you know they I think they met in Milan at first but then they went back to Florence and then and he started studying all he wanted to study this so he he realized his his uh, his physician his doctor was named Facino but he had this really brilliant son Marsilio and so he so uh, Cosimo they he decided to train the son 
to, you know, he wanted him to learn Greek. So he studied with these Greek scholars and he learned Greek so he could translate all these Greek texts into Latin so everybody could read them. So they started translating Plato, but then they got all the, the, her, the hermetic material. They started translating that and then they started in Plotinus and all these things. So they all started coming in. So then Pacino became like the preeminent Neoplatonic philosopher. This is the whole rebirth of Neoplatonic philosophy in Renaissance Italy and it started influencing all the arts. So then when, when Botticelli was hired to paint these pictures about a Venus, you know, he did, he did uh, the Primavera, which is the, the, the Venus is clothed. And then, there's, you know, there's all flowers around and the muses and everything, right? And Hermes off on the side. Okay, but then he was, he was he want, there, according to Plato in the a symposium, there's two Venuses. You know, there's the worldly Venus and then the otherworldly Venus. So, that the, so the nude Venus is supposed to be the otherworldly Venus because that's the one born of the foam from, from uh, you know, uh, from the heavens. So, like, basically the story is that, you know, Zeus castrated Uranus and his testicles fell into the sea and, and, then, uh, and then the foam, uh, the, well, the sperm from the testicles created Venus. I mean, it's not such a, a nice story when you hear it, but the thing is, <laughs> but the thing is, it was, but, but Uranus is supposed to be the heavens, so, she's, so she comes from the heavens, so she's the celestial Venus, right? Okay, so now he was sent, so his, the patrons who hired him sent him to Vicino for instruction when he painted this painting. So when he painted the birth of Venus, which a lot of people know this painting, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a major Western icon, right? Okay, that sanctified the nude, because remember the story I told you about how they were sort of afraid of the statues of Venus earlier? Yes. Okay, so here we are in the 1400s, and, and he paints this nude, but now it's sanctified by Facino, who's actually a priest and astrologer and all these things, and, and, and saying, well, no, you see, the clothed Venus is the worldly Venus that presides over sexuality, but the otherworldly Venus is nude and pure. Okay, so now the nude's been sanctified as like, the, like this pure form. So like, like, for instance, like when Titian did Sacred and Profane Love, a lot of people misinterpret the painting because there's two women sitting by a fountain, one's clothed and one's nude. And, 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 and people go, which one's which? I assume nude's the profane, but no, the clothed one's the profane, the nude is sacred. See, and then you start seeing naked images of Christ. Now, so Michelangelo studies uh, Neoplatonism also. And then he starts, doing, he does the Sistine Chapel. And then you see like, in the Sistine Chapel, he's doing the nude Christ that almost looks like Apollo. Like he doesn't have a beard, he's got gold you know, hair or like curly hair and he's nude. And you know, it's, actually, yeah. it's obviously painting Apollo and saying it's Christ. Yeah. So. So it's a synthesis again, like they're reviving, they're not only reviving the artwork, but in reviving the artwork, they're reviving the philosophy, but the philosophy they're reviving isn't this, sanct you know, this isn't this, uh, you know, cleaned up Platonism, you know, that's sterile. It's like this Neoplatonism that's mystical. Okay, yeah. so that influences all the arts. Now, this is when the Tarot was created. Yes. In this atmosphere. And who created, and see, the thing is everybody, you know, they, there's all this, all the writers are always trying to uh, theorize about who created the Tarot. The people who created the Tarot were artists. Obviously, it's a work of art. That's the whole point what I was saying before. The Tarot is a work of art. The people who created it were artists. The artists yes. were influenced by Neoplatonism. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't right. stupid. You know, they, they, these right. are, they, the artists were people, these are the some of the most educated people in the culture at that time because yes. they're the ones yeah. that illustrated the books. They had to be able to read them. <laughs> yeah. I you think know, that that's not, a brilliant. Not everybody uh, could read. Not every peasant could read. You know, see that. See there was and there was this rebirth of you know printing, like with the printing press and movable type in in the 1540s. You know, uh, Gutenberg and all that. Uh, th by the the later 1400s, there's this explosion of printing. Like they were pr they printed more books than they did from the uh, from the end of the Roman Empire till then. You know, like all the books had to be hand done, and even, and even when they print them, they had to you know, they would, would carve the whole page as one block. Now they can make movable type and do it faster. So now they're in that 50 year period, they printed more books than in the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years before. And, 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 and all the merchants could read and write. So now it wasn't just religious people reading. Uh, you know, there's a middle class that was wanting books and they're reading. But then there was all, but so now in these books with movable type, you know, woodcut, illustrations fit right in. So there's, all, so there's a big explosion of, of like these artists who could do woodcuts and work for printers. Now the printers realized, they said, well, you know, we, we have all these artists working for us and we should put them to work to do other things we could sell for people who can't read, you know, or for people who can read and can't read, you know. So they created, so they would use, they use the woodcut artists to make these cards. They made saint cards which, you know, the pilgrims who went into the cities to go to the cathedral, they'd want to buy a picture of the saint to take home. 
and now they could make a print, which it wasn't hand painted, it was much cheaper. Also, they started making playing cards because that was really big. So, so that's why you see the early tarot cards. There's no, you, you don't see names written on them because they're not trying to, they don't want to put things on that you had to read. Yes. You know, it's not until yeah. later when we come to France when you see that there's titles on them. That's fascinating. Yeah, so, I think so anyway, but, it, but the point is what you asked. It's like, so Neoplatonism was, influenced all the arts and the Tarot was one of the arts that was influenced by it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's a great answer. It explains it very, very well. Uh, and I highly recommend your book for pe anybody who's interested uh, in learning more about that. Um, so usually well, I, I give this lecture, like I, I lecture at the Metropolitan Museum of Art a couple of times a year usually. And I haven't, of course, I haven't done it this year <laughs> because yeah. the museum was closed for months. And like, you know, now, now we can't have big groups there. But the thing yeah. is, uh, we, go, we go into the back room where they have the print collection. And they have some of the oldest woodcut tarot cards in the world there. Yeah. So, so, so they're all printed cards, but we go through the card collection. I would bring in like 14 people at a time and I would lecture, you know, for like four hours about all this stuff. And we'd look at the actual artwork. Wow. And basically some of the stuff I'm telling you now would be, right, you know, stuff I would say in that lecture. Yeah. Now, um, are you a fan of the uh, Tower de Marseille? I, you're, I know you're creating a Marseille deck now. Um, well, the, you, the thing is, the, the, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a, one of the pivotal decks in, in tarot history. And it's got, and I, and I think that, the mystical story is in there. Once yes. you understand it. So that's what I'm trying to bring up. See, what, what I'm doing in, in the, I'm reinterpreting the art in my own style. Yes. You know, but, but still influenced by uh, Renaissance artwork, Renaissance woodcuts. But I'm also, all the trumps, I'm associating them with quotes from the Hermetica, from the, the her, you know, the text written by Hermes Trismegasus. Yes, I, I saw that. I, it's, it looks fast. I can't wait to, so my friend Jamie Kelly, uh, she's, uh, I asked a few people if they had questions and she was one, she's a super fan of yours. Okay. Uh, and uh, she said, <laughs> she said, you're her biggest tarot crush is what she said. Um, and she wants to know um, if, when the uh, Tower of Marseille will be complete. It, it's, it is complete. Oh, it is. I just have to, well, I just I got the quote from the printer, and it's just a matter of you know I, I signed it an ISBN number and I and I have to like register it, and then I'm going to send the artwork to the printer. But then, you know, it's not printed yet. I mean, it's, it takes months to get printed. So hopefully, yes. we'll about this by spring. Wow, that's great. It's very exciting. Did you uh, consider maybe doing like a like I know because you have the alchemical magnus magnum opus? Is that the simplified version of the? Yeah, uh, the, the the uh yeah the uh. The, the tarot of the uh, alchemical magnum opus yeah it's it's basically like the cards are a little squarer and what i did is it's basically uh, it was an artistic uh experiment i did where i was at first i was wondering if i could have it printed as woodcuts because that's why i simplified so it couldn't be done, done as woodcuts but yeah. then it was going to be so expensive that i don't think my audience could afford it yeah <laughs> so it i said okay, I, so i'll just do the artwork that way and have it printed well if you look at cartogram with their uh, i don't know if you're familiar with um Cartogram, the French tarot company, but they're they're making these very high end handmade tarot much, decks that are for? like three hundred euros. Like, yeah, uh, I think the, actually, well, the the so their majors only of the Al Oswald Worth is one hundred and eighty euros. My friend uh, bought the um, one of the best Sons, um, and it was uh, like. 300 euros something like that it's like yeah, well, 280 yeah, well, euros yeah with well, the i i i had I had someone who who does uh you know um a printer who would who would do a letter press which is like the modern equivalent of woodcuts but it yeah. but i would end up having to sell a deck for a thousand dollars yeah that's and i said yeah, well, that's, you know this is going to be really limited i can't yeah and i can't put out all this money to do it and then just sell 10 decks you know yeah, people will pay a hundred, two hundred, even, but a thousand. Yeah. That you, yeah, but you're gonna the, sell maybe three. But, <laughs> now, what I try to do is like, you know, I you know I came up with a new box design. See, I have a lot of antique decks I buy, you know, and I have decks where where they have that two part box like that, that where you know where it's like a slip case that goes over the box and it's got a yes. cover. Okay, so I took pictures of that and I showed it to my printer and I said, look, I want a box like this. So I said, oh yeah, we'll make that. Because you know, it gets printed in China, and they'll, they're so accommodating, they'll just do anything. Yeah. And, and I said, okay. And then I and I looked and I said, okay. But what I also I want the gold edges on the cards because I really like that's coming out nice, you know. And then I realized that uh, I really think it looks richer with a matte finish instead of the glossy. It looks more, you know, it gives it it, it gives it a, a more artistic quality. It's not that you don't get that glare. I agree with you. But it's still it's still lacquered, so it's waterproof. Yeah. 
Okay, so I said, okay, so do the matte finish. I want the gold edges, you know, and and then you know, do the cloth box. So I did it with that one, and then that looked so successful. And I also did that, you know, the, I did that Lunarmon, the Japanese Lunarmon. Yeah, yeah, I I didn't I haven't seen that one, but uh, I do know some people well, who got first, that. That was the first one I did with the the two part box. Okay. Yeah, okay. I know you did it with the alchemical, uh, the fifth and, edition. That's and afterwards I said, okay, I'll do the next alchemical edition. I'm going to do that box and the gold yeah. and everything. And now I did it with the uh, the sevenfold mystery, and of course that's the way the new uh, the uh, the alchemical tarot of Marseille will come out. I know. I I, I think I may have to get the uh, the sevenfold mystery because I have one of the original um, sevenfolds in the tuck box, but I really like this box, and it's something that I'm working with now since I'm reading your book, and I'm like I'm really enjoying it. So I think I may have to get a backup copy of my next order. I will probably do that, but I'm going to wait for the Marseille to come out. So I'll just get them well, both. The Marseille deck, I want to tell you, the, the, it has a little book in it, but it's not a little book. It's got 58 pages. Nice. So the book will fit in the, in the box with it. It'll be the same size as the cards, which are going to be like five inches high. And then, and the book's going to be, you know, like a, like perfect down, not one of those staple books because it's, it's going to be actually a little book in there. Great. Oh, that's, that's exciting. So I'm so I'm really because I because I felt like okay this really needs explanation it's not like it is like oh this means yeah. it means that I want to explain why I put those quotes with with this card and is yeah. there a uh, is there a historic uh, Marseille that it's based on is it like a type um do you, well, you have it, like a type one a type two it, is it like a Dodal it, it, well the the Jean Dodal the Jean, uh, Jean Noble is the oldest one right Oh, uh, yes Noble yep yeah and the, and the, and Noble is a little later but the thing is. Um, the Jean Noble, I, I like that one. It's very crude. Like the thing is, the, the French decks, they're obviously folk art. You know, that, yeah. it's almost like people are afraid to say that. They go, oh, it's beautiful. It's, like, it's folk art. Come on. It's, obviously, this is, these yeah. are made by people who were like folk artists. They weren't highly trained. Uh, but, you know, but there's a, cer there's a certain beauty to that. Like, especially because, you know, we come from a culture with modern art and abstraction. So we can appreciate the abstract beauty. But the thing is that at the same time, there were people doing woodcuts that were much more, you know, detailed and involved, like Albert Durer, you know, somebody like that. So I was, so I tried to reinterpret the images, not as a folk artist, but as if I was, you know, more like a trained artist, like I am. Yeah. You know, and tried to make them more realistic. And, and, um, but, but as far as the symbolism, I really like uh, the Jean Noble. One of the reasons, I, I, one of the things I like about it is on the sun card, uh, the two figures aren't just two, you know, most people think there's two little boys there or something, but you can see they're obviously a young man and a young woman who has breasts. So a young man and a young woman. What was the last part? Sorry, so the woman has breasts. So you can see. Oh, breasts. They're like uh, yes. you know, like young adults. Yeah. Not just two children. Yeah. And then you see how, and that fits. See, that makes the whole alchemical symbolism work better. Yeah. Okay. So now the thing is, so when when you see like you'll see other decks like. This, another thing I just discovered too is that the like Florence had a much bigger role in developing the tarot than pre previously we knew about. This has more come out recently. It's not even in my book, you know. But in this little book that I'm putting in the, in the Marseille deck, I'm, I'm explaining the, the role Florence had because because it seems like the Marseille, the series of images that we think of as the standard, the tarot Marseille comes from Florence originally. Yeah, and and then works its way to Milan and from Milan to France. So. Uh, now, if you look later, like see in 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 Florence, they didn't call the tarot the tarot. Like originally, it was nobody called it tarot because it was called triumphi, which means the, the parade, the triumph. Yeah. So, so there would, you know, carte da triumphi, which means a deck of cards with a, with a, this parade at it, which is the trump cards. And in fact, that's where the word trump comes from, triumphi. So, uh, so but in Florence, they called it a minchiati. Which just means that means like a foolish thing. Yes. Like a, oh, it's a fool thing we do. You know. So uh, now what happened is in the 1500s they expanded the the, the uh, Florentine deck got expanded so they gave it 40 trumps. And so the term Minchiati usually now is applied to the 40 trump Florentine deck, uh, whereas and and, and uh, you know not anymore to the 78 card deck. You know, uh, so, you know with the 20 21 trumps. So uh, but the, but the Minchiati, it's interesting because right away on, on a lot of the, uh, the hip cards, there were, there's imagery on them that's allegorical. Not on everyone, but on a lot of them. Where you'll see like there's Hannibal on, you know, on an elephant or there's a, a fox guarding the hen house or you know, things that are you know, things based on Aesop's fables. And, okay, so, 
and and also like as we you know like I have a I have a, quite a few historic Minchiati cards in my collection. In fact, they're ones you know because there's they have like there's a, there's a page of them. Look, I think there's like five of them from this deck in the Metropolitan Museum, and now I have six cards from that same deck myself. So uh, it's a it's a deck that was probably created in the late 1700s into the early 1800s. And, and, and it's got this, and the style of it, I really like the way the pips are done on, that, on the Minchiati. So, my, so even though my deck is, a, is based on Marseille, a lot of the pips, I'm basically more on the Minchiati and I'm adding the little uh, figures and stuff that you know, will, will give the meaning the same, basically they have the same meanings that the pips have in the, my alchemical tarot. But the, but the thing is it's worked out with this, where you have the repetition of Susan, but you have little figures in there worked in between them or playing with them that uh, su suggest a divinatory meaning. And, you know, but but the but the trump cards are very strongly based on uh, the traditional Marseille deck, and the royal cards again. I, you know, I tried to keep you know uh, keep close to it, but I, I, there's little t tweaks I do to bring out the meaning more. Yeah. You know? Do you collect uh, Tower of Marseille by all uh, by any chance? Do you have like more like I historic have, Marseille decks? I have I have some really old like I have some you know I have a couple of cards from the uh, 1700s, but I was more interested in the Minchiati. Okay. And, and I and I have an Atela, a complete Atela that was printed in France uh, in uh, 1890, which is which is hand colored, engraved and hand colored, and. Okay. Uh, um, you know, and I see when I give lectures, I would bring some of my, you know, besides I'm at the Met and we're looking at theirs, I bring some of my collection too to show people. Sure. So when, and whenever this pandemic's over and we can get back to th things, people can come to the Met and see a lot of stuff. Yeah, that, that will be brilliant. And uh, of course, I'm going to put your website down below uh, in the details. And I, uh, you know, recommend people uh, checking your website out. Uh, and I do appreciate you. Uh, the, the hour sort of flew by. We're, we're a little over. Um, but uh, have you, I just want to ask you, have you, are you familiar with Nicholas Rolicon, the, the, the uh, tarot deck that was, it's sort of like an older tarot to Marseille. Um, so, this is a. I don't, I don't know it. No. This is a, a deck that was created by uh, uh, Pablo Robledo and his. Um, he goes by Taro Tavo, but it's Octavio. I, I can't remember his last name. Um, yeah, that, now you show me, it looks familiar. Yeah. But yeah, this is and it's got the really cool backs. Um, yeah, that's like an antique back. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. I actually really like it. It's a majors only, but it has the four. Um, it has the four aces, and it also has uh, the two of pentacles. But uh, and it's very as you, if you look at the magician, it's very dodal here. You know yeah. what I mean. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm I'd like to send you a copy of it because uh, I appreciate you coming on. Um, you. So yeah, it's it's a majors only plus the four uh, aces and um, like I said, the two of pentacles with the signature. So I, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, and, uh, of course I'll get the information from, from you, uh, through email. I think I have your address anyway, cause I ordered some stuff from you. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just, I really appreciate it, uh, Robert. And I hope that, uh, you enjoyed your, your time here. And, well, uh, it's nice to have, uh, you know, sort of like, I felt like we're visiting. Yeah. Which isn't something I've been doing a lot lately. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I know it's, it's a little, uh, nerve wracking. I don't know how things are up in New York, but, uh, I feel like it's getting a little like crazier here with the, I'm, I'm starting to actually know people who have COVID now, which yeah. is, is strange. Like, whereas well, last year it was like just rumors of people. But Wald Amberstone, I don't know if you know him. He's the head of the Tarot school. He had it. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, well, our niece, our niece actually, um, technically I'm quarantining now because my, um, we were at, we were at my, um, sister-in-law's on Halloween night and one of our nieces actually has it now, but her parents don't luckily. So we, I think we dodged a bullet, um, yeah. but, and neither of us are sick, but we're technically, I think supposed to quarantine until we get a test. And so we've just been doing that. Steven works from home anyway. So it's, it's, it's not been a big deal. That's the thing when you, you like, if you do creative work, lots of, lots of people work from home anyway. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I hope you're staying well. And uh, again, I thank you and, and best to you uh, and your family. Any any oh, announcements you want to make? Uh, also, I'm, I'm, I'm publishing another book that's written by uh, Scott Martin. Well, Scott was, he was picking a card a day from the Alchemical Tarot and then writing about it on Facebook each day, you know, uh, and, and using it for insight and solace during the pandemic. 
in, since the start of the pandemic. So then he put them all together and he said, well, this will make a good book. So I said, okay, well, I'll publish it. So I'm just finishing that off now, like, you know, editing it. And that should go to the printer soon too, along with the, uh, you know, great. Alchemical Toro Marseille. Okay. And they'll be able to find information about that on your website. So yeah, I'm, I should get stuff, put stuff up there about it soon. I've already designed the cover. So you have the book coming out, you have the uh, Alchemical, Alchemical Tarot de Marseille. And then what was the deck that you have that you're pre-printing again? What was, uh, you mentioned a deck that you were reprinting. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm reprinting my Hermes playing card Oracle. Okay. If you knew about that, but I and I changed the the coloring on the box because I didn't like the gray box so much. I changed it to more of a, a tan color. Cool. And uh, um, and I thought it made the it made the image of the the fortune teller on the front sort of pop out. Nice. Yeah, I that's actually on my list too. So I'm trying to uh, behave myself with the tarot buying, but you know. Well, that I, one's only that one's only twenty dollars. Yeah, I, I did see that. I should have got the last time I ordered. I wanted it. And I was like, well. I, I, I have so many throw it in with something else. You won't even pay for shipping. Then, so. That's true. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, yeah. I, I buy a lot of playing card decks too. Um, and I do use them. Um, in fact, we've been doing some reading. Um, my friend Chris and I uh, on occasionally we will read um, playing cards. Well, we did one and it went really well. So we plan to do more um, like live uh, playing card readings just for fun for a group of friends and everything. Um, you know, cause we're both tarot people, but, using the playing cards kind of good practice in a way it's like you know it's it's more it's the reverse of reading majors only you know what i mean it's like so now i know that there's other probably we probably don't do it the way that most people read it because we read them like you know tarot pips but you know we have a lot of fun doing it so yeah well that I, it's okay <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i mean you know basically i mean basically when i teach it the Essentially, what you're doing with the cards is you're you're putting them together, allowing them to tell you a story, and then the the story will have meaning for you. Yeah, that's I mean that's the simplest way I can explain. That Definitely to and absolutely, it's that's the way I see it too. Um, and Rachel said something similar when she was on you. Know, she's all about the story. So, I mean, it's it's great. You know what I mean? It's it's a really uh, for me. It's just something that sort of consumed all my time now. You know, because I I never really saw myself really getting into it like I am, but the last couple of years I've just been really interested in tarot as I sort of consume my life. <laughs> Every book that I've read in the last year and a half has been a tarot book. So it's of okay. some sort. Well, uh, well, you know, that's, you know, the first one's free. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much, Robert. I appreciate it. Uh, best to you and your family. And uh, this, I, I'm going to be putting this out tomorrow, just so you keep an eye. I'll send you a link also. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Robert. Take be care. well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.